going to talk about a TikToker who regretted making a video about Kamala Harris, who is Canadian and who owns a company called Be Better. His name is Chile Mahos Pitakakis. And I'm first gonna go through his video about Kamala Harris and then his apology to her. Hi, so I have a master's degree in business and today I'm going to use it to analyze the marketing strategy of Kamala Harris's campaign and ultimately why I believe if she continues with the horrible marketing strategy she has been employing, why she will ultimately end up losing the presidency to Donald Trump. Just because you have a master's degree in business doesn't mean you have any type of knowledge on political strategy. So obviously this is a highly emotional and contentious topic for a lot of people, but the reason why I did want to speak on it is that I think there's a lot of parallels to be drawn between the marketing of a product and the marketing of a political candidate. And while I wish that wasn't the case, because I wish that politics was less of an exercise in personal branding and more of a deeper discussion on substantive policies that will actually be impacting the everyday lives of human beings, that just simply is not the case. So, and although I'm not American, I am Canadian, your elections have consequences for the entire world, so I think anybody that wants to put their two cents in is allowed to. Here's a rally for me as a Haitian American citizen who only votes in America. I do not talk about other elections from other countries because I simply do not have the knowledge of what's going on everyone else, everywhere else other than the knowledge I do have here because I've seen it. Therefore, I cannot have two cents in your elections, you cannot have two cents in my elections. So based on my objective analysis, I believe that Kamala Harris's campaign is built upon very flawed marketing strategy that is very heavily relying on superficial social media engagement, identity politics, and a highly crafted and tightly controlled public image of her persona that is so far removed from the reality of who she is and so socially and media engineered to the point that it is essentially a house of cards that is doomed to collapse. So the first marketing strategy that Kamala Harris is employing and we are all collectively experiencing it whether we realize it or not is the blank slate strategy. This is essentially where she is being intentionally vague and ambiguous in the language that she uses and the way that she appears publicly in order to take advantage of the psychological phenomenon of projection. Because if you are extremely vague and generic and say some of the right words without specifically committing to policies or being very clear about what your values are, human beings will simply project onto you what they want to see. Progressives will see her as extremely progressive and forward thinking. More moderate voters will see her as somebody that's a little bit more measured and you can kind of of see reasoning behind why they're doing it. I don't think it's completely stupid, but I think it is doomed to fail because although it is working in the short term, she's going to eventually be put into scenarios like debates where she will be forced to take firm stances on topics. And because she hasn't done that intellectual work to decide where she really lands on these important issues, she may end up looking unqualified for the job. First of, uh, she's not being vague at all because of how eloquently she speaks. Kamala Harris's campaign isn't built on a flawed marketing strategy. Her campaign is beautifully executing their strategy to attract younger voters, something that you don't completely understand. It's really not so far moved from the reality of who she is when she is speaking about her experience as an American citizen to relate to those who have gone through the same way as her when it comes to making minimum wage. That is her persona, and her persona isn't being controlled by anyone. It's obviously not a house of cards. And she's not being ambiguous in the language that she uses. I really fail to understand why people who aren't knowledgeable on American politics speak like they claim to know when they are not from the United States. So the next issue with the blank slate strategy is the only reason it's even remotely effective is specifically because she is solely relying on identity politics. And although I completely understand and respect the excitement associated with nominating the first woman president, the first black woman president, the first South Asian American black woman president, 
And that's something that is exciting and something that will understandably galvanize a certain demographic of the population that will vote for her solely based on that alone. I do not believe it is a substitute for an actionable policy platform that will actually impact the lives of the American people because people are currently suffering economically and they want to understand and feel secure in the fact that you have a plan to ameliorate their suffering. So it seems like her campaign is relying on the sole fact that people will be so excited to vote for the first black woman that they will be willing to overlook the fact that she doesn't have a true vision for the country. I do not believe that is something that should be relied upon, especially in the context of the United States, where the election will be decided based upon tens of thousands of votes in specific swing states. And the other issue with this lack of a policy platform is it leaves her very vulnerable to attacks from Donald Trump because they can project any image onto her that they want and she has no reasonable way to articulate a defense to them because she doesn't really stand for anything. That's where you're wrong, Mr. B better who sells honey shit and claims he can speak on something that he doesn't have a degree that's actually based on politics. She does stand for something. She has explained about an opportunity economy. And you yourself can go on KalmaHarris.com to read her policy positions. It's really not that hard at all. She does have a true vision for the country. But right now, she does not need to speak to the media about it. Her focus right now is to campaign and meet the voters. Besides, Donald can do whatever he wants to attack her. That won't change. She knows who she is and where she stands on the issues. Besides, Donald Trump attacking her doesn't do much for his campaign. It only hurts it. So the next issue that I have with the Kamala Harris campaign is they seem to be very heavily relying on social media engagement as well as celebrity endorsements to create this sort of image of widespread popularity. The issue with using social media as a way to evaluate the current success of the Kamala Harris campaign is that social media metrics can be extremely inflated and very misleading because a huge demographic on TikTok, for example, are people under the age of 18. They will not be voting. And it's also in further inflated by the fact that many people on TikTok are in international countries who just enjoy watching the politics for the show of it, like me. But we will not be voting in the election, so it can lead her campaign to be in a place where they are overestimating their grassroots support when in reality they don't have it because it doesn't really exist. Dude, as the baby gen boomer generation used to say, they're hip of the young generation. There's nothing wrong with the Harris Waltz campaign using social media to get with the times. Like how else are you supposed to reach out and attract to get more people's attention? And celebrity endorsements are a good thing because it helps to mobilize to get more people who are fans of a certain celebrity to vote for Kamala Harris. There is no problem with that. Also, you do realize that people who are 18 in America like beans, right? It isn't just the under 18 crowd that likes memes. And no shit there are people like you who live in a different country. Her campaign is solely focusing on us, the American people, not the Canadians. So the danger is that this perceived popularity may not translate into actual votes, particularly in the swing states, which will be the deciding factors of this election. And her campaign's obsession with social media and viral moments and celebrity culture is further illustrated by the decisions they're making by having Megan the Stallion twerking on stage or thinking it was a good idea to have Oprah Winfrey appear at the DNC talking about the middle class because they clearly do not have an understanding that the average American and average person absolutely despises celebrities, does not want to be talked down to from them, and will not be voting based upon who they endorse. There is no danger. You're being illusional for saying that. And it is a good idea to have Megan the Stallion and Oprah Winfrey at the DNC. Do you want to know why? Because 11% of US adults can be persuaded by celebrity endorsement and about 19 of the young adults say the same. The impact of a celebrity endorsement is strongest among your regular or new voters. People that are newly interested in politics political issues or those who are typically preoccupied by our concerns such as celebrity gossip are people whom Swift's influence could matter. 
And by the way, in case you didn't notice something that will definitely make my point for me, is that the Hulk Hogan, a former WWE wrestler, has been in the RNC since July of this year. At this point, both Trump and Harris are trying to attract the marginal undecided voters while simultaneously energizing their core supporters. Both the Trump and Harris campaigns have received many celebrity endorsements over the past several months. Kamala Harris has been endorsed by Jeff Bridges, Cher, Jamie Lee Curtis, Viola Davis, Mark Hamill, Spike Lee, John Legend, Demi Lovato, Megan Thee Stallion, Amy Schumer, Barbara Streisand, Kerry Washington, and Bradley Whitford. Donald Trump has been endorsed by Jason Altine, Roseanne Barr, Hulk Hogan, Kick Rock, Ember Rose, and John Voight. If Swift were to make an appearance at a Harris rally, there is no doubt that she would electrify the crowd and it would become a major story. By bringing attention to candidates and issues, celebrities can keep the politician in the news cycle. They can also make political activism the hip thing to do. Politicians are generally disliked, so if they can manage to be cool or based or breath in the eyes of a popular celebrity, they can distance themselves from the stigma associated with establishment politicians. Which is what Kamala Harris is exactly doing. And celebrity endorsements, by the way, have worked for President Barack Obama, who got endorsed by Oprah Winfrey, who was then a talk show host. Because if it worked for Barack Obama, who became the first black president when he was elected in 2008, then the same can happen to Kamala Harris, who will become the first black female president of the United States. So saying that the average American despises celebrities is completely abhorrent because if the average American did despise celebrities then they wouldn't be endorsing a political candidate of their choice. But some things are more important than money. Celebrities are people too. They have opinions, they want to make a difference, and unlike the rest of us, they have a platform that allows them to reach millions of people who are interested in what they have to say. So saying that the average American who isn't necessarily a voter that doesn't want to be talked down to from them, who aren't going to vote for someone who is endorsed by a celebrity is just stupid and ridiculous. Because there are people who don't necessarily pay attention to politics that are going to be persuaded by one of their celebrities that they love and therefore are going to be voting for the presidential candidate that they endorsed. Some research has suggested that Barack Obama gained an additional 1 million votes in 2008 because of Oprah Winfrey's endorsement of him. Both Winfrey and Swift have an enormous following and if even a small percentage of them took their political cues from the entertainers that could be just enough to swing the election from one candidate to the other. Because of the particular gear system known as the Electoral College, where one wins the presidency not because one is more popular, but because one won the correct combination of different weighted states, a few thousand votes and a handful of key swing states can make all the difference. No doubt several political scientists in America are thinking about clever ways to measure the swift debate in this year's election. And I'll go even further that I think it does the complete opposite of what they're trying to accomplish. The mere presence of Oprah Winfrey will directly result in people voting against Kamala Harris because of how much people despise celebrity culture and despise billionaires like Oprah Winfrey and everything that she stands for. The majority of Americans do not hate Oprah Winfrey. There might be a few who do because they do that for no reason, but the majority of Americans do not hate her. And again, people did vote for Barack Obama because of that one celebrity endorsement from Oprah Winfrey. So nobody is voting against Kamala Harris. Just because you claim that people despise celebrity culture, I for one like celebrities and I do not despise celebrity culture. If I had, 
then what is the fucking point of watching a TV show or a movie then? And if I was to summarize the core problem with the personal brand of Kamala Harris and something that I think will continue to bubble underneath the surface of her campaign until it inevitably explodes, it is an authenticity issue. And the perfect example of this is the glaring contradiction of the fact that Kamala Harris is using TikTok as a way to influence young people to vote for her, to make it appear like she cares about their issues and that she hears them, when in reality she is part of the administration that introduced legislation to ban the app, which is the most insane violation of freedom of speech I have seen in my entire lifetime. And if she does become president in November, come January, the app is set to be taken away from the app store forever. They literally banned the app because of lobbying from Mark Zuckerberg, because instead of spending money on his own app, improving Instagram, he would rather take out his competitor altogether. And because we have a completely corrupt government, he's able to do that. So I can't even imagine the fact that she's been able to run this campaign and has not been questioned about this glaring contradiction. And because we have a completely corrupt government. Okay, first of all, why are you saying we? Because last I've just heard, you're Canadian, right? And this brings us, of course, to the most obvious question, which is why hasn't she been questioned about this or really anything important? And the reason is that her campaign officials know that she has a historical tendency to say extremely stupid things and make very dumb gaffes when she goes off script. When she is reading off script, she is good, she is charismatic, she hits her points. When she is asked a question that is in any way she is unprepared to answer, she makes huge mistakes. Here are a few that she's done before. At one point, she said three times, three times in three separate videos, that 220 million Americans died from COVID. She obviously meant to say, <laughs> Not that, because there's 300 million Americans. I think we would know if they all died from COVID. Another time, she was visiting the DMC, which is the demilitarized zone in South Korea, and she praised the Republic of North Korea and said that she wanted to be allies with them, and she didn't realize that it was South Korea. And then she obviously says word salads a lot where we don't understand the context of all in which she lives and where she came before her pretend to be. One of my favorite quotes from her, she said, it is time for us to do what we have been doing and that time is every day every day it is time look buddy i still like a politician even if they misspeak misspeaking is not a huge problem for me these days and this is just the reality she is not good speaking off the cuff she knows it and her campaign knows it if you need further proof let's watch how she answered a very simple question on inflation um and also what else are you going to do to fix this problem with inflation? All right, thank you. Well, let's start with this. Uh, prices have gone up, and families and individuals are dealing with the realities of, of the, that bread costs more, that gas costs more. And we have to understand what that means. That's about the cost of living going up. And the reason why I'm showing you this is so you understand the fragility of such a tightly controlled image when she is inevitably put into a high pressure environment like a debate or an interview where she has to answer questions and she can't articulate herself. This crafted idea that she's an extremely competent person gets shattered immediately. So if Kamala Harris really wants to win this election, she needs to radically and quickly move away from the superficial hollow rhetoric that she's been engaging in and put together a substantial policy platform and articulate a very clear vision that she has for the country. If she does, I not only think she will win the presidency, but all three branches of government, potentially laying the groundwork for actual transformational change. And if she doesn't, I think she will simply become a cautionary tale of someone who sought the highest office in the land without actually fully grasping the weight of its responsibilities. And she also has to sit down for some press interviews because it's making her look very entitled that she received the nomination not getting one vote and won't even talk to the American people directly when Donald Trump is. Now, after Tulema host Pizza Caucus made a video on Kamala Harris, he made an apology to her. So the first thing that I said in that video that I'm so disappointed in myself for saying is I said that Kamala Harris's campaign is mostly centered around identity politics, particularly her identity as being the first woman president. And the reason now why that was such a stupid comment is that it is factually wrong. And 
after spending the day talking with people who have made videos about my video and watching videos for myself through a different lens, I now see she actually hasn't mentioned that one time. And this is so disappointing for me to know and to realize and admit that I adopted a right-wing talking point to the point that I actually thought it was true and then perpetuated that as if it was a fact when it is irrefutably wrong. Kamala Harris hasn't even mentioned one time the fact that she's a woman and that is something that has been projected onto her by other people. And I'm so disappointed in myself for saying something that is just literally not true. I think part of it was maybe I was projecting the fears from Hillary Clinton's campaign where that was the focus and Kamala Harris's is, is not. It's completely different. And she hasn't made that the focus at all. So I want to apologize to everybody for using my platform to repeat something that I can now see was literally just false. And the reason why I'm so specifically disappointed in myself for that comment is that I've never thought of myself in my entire life as somebody that has a sexist bone in my body. I have four sisters. Every single adult friendship that I have is with women. So it's not been something that I've mentally taken inventory of before. So now to realize, actually, that I clearly had a bias because that is the only way that a factually incorrect statement like that could have been adopted in my mind as reality shows that I do have biases and things that I need to work on and I absolutely will be taking time outside of this video to realize why that happened and make sure that it never happens again. So the other specific thing that I said that I do want to hold myself accountable for is I said something to the effect of if Kamala Harris hasn't done the intellectual work on picking a specific policy, she could be in a scenario like a debate where she's backed into a corner and doesn't know what to say. The choice to use the words hasn't done the intellectual work well, although I had no malicious intention behind it, I can see it was a completely idiotic statement to make, and I need to be much more careful when I choose my words. I took a very narrow-minded view of her campaign and saw that there were no policies listed on her website, when in reality, she has spoken about many policies. And when she does, they are reported on by so many news outlets, it probably isn't necessary to have them on the website anyway, and I'm sure at a certain point she will. And to imply, which was not my intention at all, but to even imply that she's not working hard is ridiculous. And I fully recognize she's probably currently working harder than anybody else on the planet. And there's immense amount of pressure on her. And she's in a very unique situation where she's only been doing this for a month. And I fully regret my choice of words when speaking about that topic. And the other reason why my video rightfully angered and upset so many people is because of the factual reality of our society is that women are held to higher standards than men, period. And people of color are held to higher standards than white people. And women of color are arguably held to the highest standards of all. And that's true in families, in relationships, in school, in work, and in politics. At every single level, it's true. And if you need any proof of that, we can literally compare Obama's presidency to Trump's presidency. Had Obama lost an election, denied that he lost the election, and then encouraged his supporters to invade the Capitol, to override the democratic process, and take over the government violently. Does anyone actually deny the fact that he would have been eviscerated viciously by Fox News and by Republicans? He would have never lived that down. He would have never gotten away with that. And he was criticized in his presidency for the color suits that he wore because they were grasping at straws. There was nothing else they could criticize him for. And then we have Donald Trump, someone running, who actually did that and who got away with it. Can you imagine if a woman did that, how crazy the media would have made her out to be, but somehow he still retains his image as being a strong, competent, intelligent leader, which he is not. He's a crazy person. And I am so sorry that my video could have come across in any way that I would ever support him in any way, shape or form. And I want to preface this by saying I in no way am excusing the stupidity that was my decision to post that video specifically at this moment in time. And my original intention behind the video does not matter as long as the outcome was negative, which it was. But I just want to provide a little bit of context as to what my mindset was at the time. So you can hopefully understand why 
I was initially so defensive and confused by the backlash. I'm a marketing consultant, not a political consultant, clearly, but we are specifically trained to be brutally honest, even at the expense of possibly offending the client, because to not do so is considered a disservice to them. So before I filmed that video, I did some shallow research that should have been so much more thorough. But I looked at the polling of the swing states, and I noticed that Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are in statistical ties within the margin of error of every single swing state. And when I combine that with my understanding that pollsters have historically underrepresented Trump voters in the past, and also the fact that the Electoral College structurally favors Republicans, I was actually worried. And in my own stupid, twisted mind, and I understand it was dumb and it came across as dumb as it was, but I thought I was sounding the alarm and possibly bringing up a topic that could help improve her campaign, which is adopting some stronger, more progressive policy positions like Bernie Sanders. And that's ultimately the reason why I didn't post a video on Donald Trump, because I don't want to help further his campaign in any way. That is also just not the side of the internet that I'm on. I'm on Kamala Harris TikTok, so I naturally felt more compelled to speak about that. And the fact that the race is close is not only common knowledge to every single American, and you do not need to hear it from me, but it's actually further reason why I never should have filmed and posted a video that could have been contorted or used as ammunition to not vote for Kamala Harris, who is ultimately and obviously who I would vote for in a race between her and the alternative being Donald Trump. And I do want to genuinely thank everybody that held me accountable both publicly and privately, and specifically to the people who were hurt by my video, but still took the time and had the patience to speak with me in so much detail and give me the space and the grace to understand something that I should have understood and should have never happened to begin with. I'm extremely grateful for that. And ultimately, I do not believe having a social media platform is something I'm entitled to. I think it's something I have to continually earn. And I absolutely will be putting checks and balances on myself and my content to make sure a mistake like this never happens again. And to the people who are genuinely disappointed in me, I'm genuinely very, very sorry. I forgive you telling my house for the incorrect things you said about Clown Harris and realize you made a mistake and acknowledge that you're only a marketing consultant. And while I respect that you didn't have any malicious intent, I, as a voter, still take it to heart that who I'm voting for is the one who is working hard. And that politician I'm voting for is the one who has earned my vote.